Good evening. Good evening. My name is Cheryl Frank, and I am the president of Color Bright and Green. And I'm so excited to see so many faces here. For those of you on Zoom, there are, gosh, probably at least 20 people in this room. <laughs> so this is wonderful. And I'm so happy to introduce to you today, uh, Mitch Nellis, and who's also going to introduce his colleague who's talking about mushrooms with him tonight. All right, so I'm Mitch Nellis. I'm a- Mitch, the people on Zoom. Oh yeah. I'm I'm Mitch Nellis. I'm a teacher at Eastridge High School in East Irondequoit. teach uh, ecology, basically. I've um, been teaching there for about 16 years. And just recently, I got introduced to um, mushrooms. mushrooms through my friend, Jack, who's going to come over here in front of the Zoom. Um, this is Jack here, who is, uh, we're also graduates of SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. And she got me interested in mushrooms. And Jackie, would you give us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I, um, like Mitch said, I'm also a teacher at Eastridge. I teach living environment for the special ed crew. Um, and I got introduced to mushrooms when I was in college. I did a lot of work in permaculture, which is using and mimicking biology and ecology that happens all around us and applying it to our social systems. Um, so that was kind of my intro into mushrooms. And then from there, it's kind of just seemed like the best thing in the world. So I've been very interested in a hobbyist of mushrooms since. So we come here today more as facilitators of mushroom knowledge rather than experts, right? We work at a high school. So we want this to be a fun lesson. Sorry. And uh, that's kind of our goal tonight to ask questions, have conversation and grow together. Just like, you know, we hope that you will take some bits of knowledge and apply them to your own homes and lives with mushrooms because they're beautiful and fantastic. So really, we're, we're not experts. Um, what we are is more hobbyists and enthusiasts. And um, you know the way we like to teach is what we're gonna teach with you. We're gonna make it interactive. We encourage questions, we encourage comments, um, and we're not gonna provide all the answers because mushrooms and fungus uh, still have a lot of very interesting things that we don't know about. Um, if you ask us questions that we don't know the answers to, we'll be happy to say uh, we don't know um, because again, we're just exploring and we're gonna to present to you a lot of questions, but also a lot of possibilities about what mushrooms can be and are being used for, okay? Um, it's really uh, an, something that's really blowing up right now, okay? Um, yeah. Um, has anybody seen mushrooms or fungus in like popular media or come across them recently? But yeah. Um, so yeah, mushrooms are kind of seeing a resurgence right now. We should hold on to the thing. Yeah, here, let me talk about a I have to say this. Uh, no, how about this? Why don't you take um Two more minutes and finish your quiz, and then we'll move on with the presentation. All right, so everyone's got a chance to finish their quiz. By the way, we can see your results up here, and we know who know, who's doing really well and uh, who's, who's struggling maybe a little bit, but you're going to learn a lot more, all right, for those of you who aren't doing quite as well. You're going to have to talk to Ben here because if you hear your line, you can talk to Luis. Okay, all right. Okay, stay over here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're... Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. Does anybody have any reflections or questions from the quizzes? Yeah. All right, so we'll give you a few more minutes to finish up the quiz and remember the questions that you may have struggled on. Uh, and you can ask us questions about it. And again, uh, we picked trivia that. Um, most of you probably shouldn't know, uh, but that'll get you excited about knowing and figuring it out. So if you're at home, we're on this, a web-based quiz program called joinmyquizzes.com and you can type in that code and you can attempt the uh, quiz, the pre-assessment. So we can see if we have any, uh, you know, if anybody gets all of them right, we're gonna be intimidated because that means you probably know more than us. But luckily so far, it doesn't look like anybody's close, which is great. 
Oh yeah, my name is Mitch Nellis. Um, I'm a teacher at East Arundelcoy High School in Eastridge, and I teach uh, high school science. And I'm here with my colleague Jack Gear, who also teaches high school science with me. Yes. And we're both graduates of ESF. Tuning is... College of Environmental Science in Fall River Street. That's it. Yep. Right, right there. Yes. Uh -huh. Got him. <laughs> Someone say Paul Smith. Paul Smith? Yeah. Oh, you're our, you're our rivals. You actually, I'm going to ask you to leave. <laughs> Paul okay. Smith are ESF's rivals. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, they had a water um, research facility put in, and we were competing for that same grant money. So it's kind of like hard to buy. I'm so sorry. I am the same way in the classroom. I cannot say so. <laughs> Yeah, uh, SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. It's right next to Syracuse University. Um, if you've ever been to Syracuse, you know the Carrier Dome. There's the big university, and ours is right next door. Um, it's a SUNY school, completely separate, but they do take classes at each other's schools. So, like, I could take like math there. Other kids could take environmental science at my school. We will announce who got the best score on the quiz, and we're hoping that won't shame anybody, um, but or embarrass anybody. But some people are doing quite well. Oh, how are we going to motivate without telling who's the worst? I kind of want to put somebody on blast right now. <laughs> Who's the worst? Who's the worst? Who's the Someone asks a question, you can repeat the question here. Okay. Okay. Got it. All right, we're going to give it about another minute for the quiz to be finished. And then we're going to move forward with hopefully teachers. No, you can't. Okay. You can't quit. <laughs> no, it's okay. If you don't finish the quiz, there will be no punishment. Don't worry. Uh, uh, 12. 13, 14. Oh, geez. Oh, oh my God, yeah, I really got excited. Okay. Why don't I, well, we... I thought people would show up a lot earlier and yeah. need some time to kill. All right. Our technical difficulty. All right, we'll go another minute and then we'll move on and we'll see uh, who's, our, who's our grand champion of fungal trivia. Got a bunch of fun guys here. Oh, my goodness gracious. No, no, we're not doing it. <laughs> There's a fungus among us. Right. There's mushroom for more. <laughs> uh, hi, if you're at home and you're just joining us, I'm Mitch Nellis. We're talking about mushrooms. And this is my friend. Hi, I'm Jack. We're talking also about mushrooms. We went to SUNY College of Environmental Science at Forest Street, and we are teachers at East Vermont High School, East Ridge High School. Oh. Oh, you need us to get louder? Oh, we'll talk oh, louder. Okay. Not, not a problem. Is there a microphone? If you have a mic. Okay. All right. I'm not going to pretend to know how to use this. What is this stuff? Yeah. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Is this why you're there? Oh, you're doing it. all right uh whether you're done or not that's fine uh the quiz will remain open for the rest of the time so afterwards if you want to try to beat your score we don't mind if you try again you know uh we like to learn from our mistakes so if you think you can do better on another round that's fine um, what we're hoping that the quiz has got you started on is thinking about what we don't know about mushrooms, which is a lot, according to the results of this quiz. Um, <laughs> now, knowing that, I looked up all the answers, so that's kind of cheating. Um, but I do want to get a round of applause for our current leader, uh, Pat Wardinger. Pat Wardinger. Yeah. 
Yeah, very nice work. Uh, oh, okay. All right. All right. All right. Very good. All right. Um, excellent job. You all did wonderfully. <laughs> Being supportive. All right. All right. Um, here's some facts about mushrooms. Uh, I just want, you know, just to get you all thinking, you know, when we think about mushrooms, we usually have a very narrow view of it. Um, fungi, uh, there's more than five times as many fungi as plants. Um, we're still discovering the enzymes present in fungi. Uh, there's debate about the largest organism on earth being one continuous fungi in a national forest in Oregon wow. uh, that might be as old as 8,000 years old, continuously living. Um, when we're talking about, we're gonna get to the, the nuts and bolts of what a mushroom actually is. Uh, but when you see it, what we see is a mushroom is really just the fruit of the mushroom and a whole bunch is hidden underground. Um, which is about 95% of the mushroom is actually underground. When we call that mushroom, it's like the apple of the tree, okay? Um, and it has a lot of uses beyond just putting on pizza, okay? Uh, we have mushrooms, we're, we're just touching the surface about what we could use mushrooms for, okay? So this is a normal model of a mushroom life cycle. Many of us have never really seen this. We all know, you know, plants life cycles. We understand human life cycles, but mushroom life cycles look a little bit different. And like Mitch was saying, there are different parts of the mushroom. So I'm going to grab this real quick. Now, this, this block here, this is the mush. oh gosh. This is the mushroom. I'll, I'll, walk, I'll walk around with it. You hold that one. I'll, I'll walk around. All right. Um, now, this part right here, this is the bowl. Can anybody from looking at that diagram, I want you guys to think, what do you think that this white substrate is, this white stuff that the mushroom is growing from? It is substrate, but it's growing, it, oh, it's, it's growing from the substrate. We call this, starts with the letter M, Mycelium! Yes. So we're going to get really good tonight at understanding the difference between mushrooms, mycelium, and fungus. Okay, we're going to get into some vocabulary because, as mentioned, I'm a teacher. Vocabulary, it all comes down to it, right? We all kind of understand that. So these spores, who has heard the word spore before? Yeah, right? We're all familiar with it. We know that it's not good to breathe in things like black mold spores. Now, mushroom spores at any given second right now, as you breathe, you are actually breathing in spores that are living in the air. Mushrooms are everywhere. And I want to change my language now. Instead of saying mushrooms, I'm gonna say fungi are everywhere. Um, so the spores are just like seeds of plants. And basically you get a spore, two spores, they get happy, they mate, and then you get a hyphal strand, which is a single, mm -hmm. oh a single cell um, and it's everywhere underground. So if you're walking anywhere across grass, soil, forest, you're stepping on thousands and thousands of single cells of hyphae every step you take. Um, and so I'm happy to go into more detail, but mostly people don't wanna talk about life cycles. Don't know why, but um, here's where we get to fungus, mushroom, or mycelium. As I said, the main body is always called mycelium. And the mycelium, what it's doing, it's not like a plant, right? It can't just sit in the sun, soak up some sunlight and do photosynthesis. Instead, a mushroom is like us. It has to eat its food. So it uses, as Mitch said before, enzymes. Enzymes work to break down and help digest different particles. So if I'm a mushroom and Mitch is food, and I go over and I touch Mitch, I'm gonna start basically breaking him down <laughs> with my hyphae strings, right? So Mitch is dead, I'm thriving. Um, and that's 
kind of how mushrooms work. So we call them in science heterotrophs because they have to eat and consume. Now, micro isofungi, a little bit different. And Mitch is going to, you want me to click on that? Don't. <laughs> so, so now, um, what we found is that, that fungi can grow in with plant roots. We call it the wood wide web. The wood wide web. Okay, so what they have discovered is that fungus can connect trees and plants to each other, share nutrients, and allow for communication between plants. So they'll even send messages between these, I, I would almost call it like an internet of fungus underneath the ground that will say, hey, there's disease happening over here, or there's stress of some sort happening over here, or here's nutrients that we can share, and it connects the plants together. Um, and you can see through this picture how much exists underground um, from this one little sampling uh, of this mic. The, all that white stuff on the left side is the fungus. The roots is actually just a small little amount underneath the plant. The rest is this fungus working and supporting the plant. On the right side, this black and white, uh, you can see the, the left of it is a healthy plant that has fungus in the soil. The right side does not. Uh, you can see that the fungus aids in the growth of the plant. Okay. Um, and it's, it's kind of an exceptional relationship between the fungus and the plant to allow for this communication. It's what has allowed everything. Oops. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and this, this symbiotic relationship between the plant and the mushroom. So we just got asked in person, what part of the plant exists? And if you look, you, it's just, we're going to circle it online just a little bit. And then the rest is all this the fungus is all... that is supporting that plant. Okay, so, and, and again, if you, have, yeah, if you have questions, just raise your hand, shout them out. Go ahead. How long generally does it take if you dig out a plant and replant it or a tree and replant it? You talk about all the bacteria connecting. Yes. Put it in a ball or put it in a new location. Mm -hmm. So the, the, okay, so just to repeat for the people at home, the question is how long does it take for plants to establish a, another mycorrhizal connection with fungus if they're transplanted or moved or disturbed? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I'm going to, Jack's the expert. Not an expert, oh. just a fan. Um, to answer your question, so there is, that is absolutely a great concern and a question to have. So when you do remove plants out, you are, you know, essentially cutting them off from their mycorrhizal friends. Now, when that root structure, that root structure is intimate with the mycorrhizae, which means it's already got that connection. So when you transplant it, you're also transplanting that mycorrhizae, which then is going to reestablish and grow in that area. There is potential for there to be other mycorrhizae present, in which case, you know, it comes down to different forms of symbiosis and competition to see who's going to, you know, support the plant the most. But uh, to be honest, I can't answer your question. That's the best I got. But we and can it, look into it. I think it. it comes down to also the health of the soil you're transplanting into, whether or not it's suitable for that mycorrhizal growth, okay, or whether it's already there. But remember, when you get that original soil, it's going to go with the plant. So there's always going to be those seeds there ready to go, I guess, is a good analogy. Yeah. I saw another hand. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, a good example of this is if you are ever looking at like a... Yeah. So oh, I'm sorry. So she asked if you are looking at an actual plant and you pull up the roots, can you see the mycorrhizae growing on that root structure? Correct? Or, or 
Yeah, so you absolutely can, but you have to look with a keen eye. Um, in a lot of cases, if you've ever looked at bark on a tree and lifted it up, you see that white cobwebby stuff, that's all mycorrhizae. So if you were to dig underground, it'd be hard because the strands of them are, you know, thinner than hair in a lot of cases, but it can be present in some areas. All right. Um, so I guess um, what, like we're gonna back up a little bit. So we'll give you some background. Um, when we think about fungus and mushrooms, you know, what do we think about? What do we use them for? Uh, anyway, just shout out some answers, you know. What's that? Eating. Eating, yeah. I mean, we think about portobellas, the, the you know, the pizza, we think about that kind of thing. Anything else? Oh. Truffles, yeah, really expect we think about truffles, really expensive mushrooms. Medicine. Okay, medicine. Okay, now that's come. We've heard a lot of we're gonna talk about medicine in a little bit. That's a great answer. We have been hearing a lot recently in the news about medicine and antidepressants. We're gonna to get to that. Anything else? Nutrition. nutrition, yeah. Beauty products also, yeah, nutrition. We're talking about the vitamins that might be present and beauty products. We also hear about those kind of things. Anything else? Okay, compost and garden soil additives. Absolutely. Eating plastic. Eating plastic, yeah, we're gonna talk about that as well, about how we, we think that there might be some possibility of um, fungus that can digest plastic. You know, we know that's a big problem in the world right now. Anything else? Away in the back. Poison. Poison. Yeah, we think. <laughs> Don't eat them. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're going to recommend that you not go foraging and just try the taste test. Okay. That's not what we want you to do. Um, but yeah, we do hear about them being poisonous. Absolutely. Anything else? That's a yeah. hallucinogenics. Yeah. That is one of the, that's going along with the medicinal properties right now that that's coming online really big. And we're gonna see some big movement in that very soon. All right, so we're gonna go back a little bit and we're gonna go um, where uh, we've come from with regards to mushrooms. We aren't inventing these things, okay? They've been around for a while um, and even their uses have been around for a while. Uh, Hippocrates used to use the, um, prescribed mushrooms as medicine. Um, he had this uh, Amadou mushroom that, uh, you know, had anti-inflammatory properties um, and also would help cauterize wounds when people, and they, they help healing processes. Um, the, uh, you guys know about the, uh, the ice man that they discovered. He had mushrooms in his, but he carried about, you know, eight things. And some of those things were mushrooms, okay? He had mushrooms in his pouch that he was going to bring, he brought with him on wherever he was going. Um, uh, the Native Americans used to use puff balls uh, to help when you got a wound because uh, they had, they would provide antioxidants and would also help people heal after they got injured. Um, and then we get into the, a little bit of the psychedelics. There's um, been some thoughts that the original psychedelics were what allowed original humans to imagine beyond themselves um, and to have imaginations and stuff like that. And there's depictions of mushrooms in um, Aztecs and Mayan ancient civilizations. Um, and then, of course, we also know that um, is a member of the fungus kingdom and the original antibiotic penicillin uh, is a form of that. And, you know, we can't discount the fact that it's probably saved, you know, in estimates of about 200 million lives. Okay. Uh, Sir Alexander Fleming, uh, just by being observant, figured out how to use this to help us out. Uh, and now that we've gone through the history, uh, we're going to start to talk about what are mushrooms today in America, right? Because mushrooms, they are different from culture to culture. And right now we are experiencing a cultural shift um, where Americans and specifically Westerners are starting to open up their minds about mushrooms. So I'm gonna go into a little bit of modern science as well as where the market, where is the economy going for mushrooms and what are some potential um, ways that you can utilize mushrooms in the growing world. Um, so first thing I want to talk about, mycotextiles. Now, mycotextiles include both textiles like clothing and fabric and dyes, 
Um, but it also, my favorite is dried mycelial bricks that can be used for construction. Now, these dried mycelial bricks are amazing because not only are they um, flame resistant naturally, they are also lacking of the chemicals that are normally in our insulation that we have our houses in. Um, they also provide natural air filter barriers as well. So building house fully of mycelial bricks has been done. Um, it has been successful. And it, there is a lot more kind of research and opportunity that can come from using this kind of brick. Um, addis additionally, we can make packaging materials like styrofoam that could replace a lot of the plastics and the styrofoam that we have. Um, and you can actually mold mushrooms into any shape that you want. I'm going to rephrase that. You can mold mycelium into any shape that you want. Um, additionally, there's myco leathers, which pretty cool. Like you could get a whole couch made out of mushrooms. Come on. Um, and then there's also mushroom and lichen dye. They have talked about using mushrooms in paints as well to help um, get rid of mold and stuff like that. So that's mycotextiles. Then we have our medicinal mushrooms. Um, I put a picture of Host Defense, which is Paul Stamets. Um, that's his collection of mushroom things. He is one of the top experts in America for mushrooms. Um, and these are just some of the benefits. I know you probably can't read them, so I'm gonna read them off, but mushrooms can help with breathing, digestion, energy, um, heart support. They can be really good for lowering cholesterol. I know that's a problem that many of us have. Um, I take a mushroom supplement every single day. I put it in my smoothie. I buy it at Wegmans. It is very accessible now, and that is great. Um, so there is a whole trove of medicinal uses of mushrooms. That's not per se my specialty. We'll get there. But if anybody has questions or needs recommendations, I am more than happy to talk with you. Um, and now we get to the psychedelic types of mushrooms, mood enhancers. Okay. Recently, there's been a lot of news about um, the uh, chemicals in psychedelic mushrooms, which have been, you know, they back in the, you know, the, the drug wars and those kind of things, it was, uh, you know, ostracized as, you know, this evil chemicals. And, and we're starting to figure out that they might have some benefit for people. Uh, just recently, they found that people treated with um, this sypho, psilocybin, psilocybin um, have within a, just a few doses have been treated for chronic depression and found relief that wasn't found with all the um, other medications that they've been provided with, um, which is really promising. Um, and it actually lasted for quite a while. Now, some of the effects were almost immediate. Um, now, I do have to say that it was a um, a limited study. So they're working on doing it with more people and trying to make it a little more official, but the initial results are very promising that they could, this could help out a lot of people with depression. And I see a couple of hands up. So people at home, we're going to answer some questions. Right. Yeah. yeah, so just comments in, in the in the room were that this was happening back in the 60s before it was outlawed and, you know, venerated as all this evil stuff. And now we're starting to find that it, they were on the right track. Uh, yeah, another question. So psychedelic mushrooms. Oh, he was asking what type of mushroom would be considered to have this beneficial benefit of having a psychedelic mushroom. So generally under the psychedelic branch, many, basically all psychedelic means is it's interacting with your brain in a way that causes some difference in your cognitive function, i.e. turning off a section of your brain or um, changing up the biochemistry. So psilocybin is the most common class of psychedelic. Um, and that word is spelled, uh, it's the last word on that first paragraph, psilocybin with a P-S-I. Um, that is generally what you would hear of as being a psychedelic mushroom. However, there are thousands of other mushrooms that have psychedelic components. For example, um, the Amanita muscaria, which is that famous red mushroom, the Mario mushroom, 
That mushroom also has psychedelic capacity. Um, it's what they believe led to the invention of Santa Claus and the reindeer because there were, yes, uh, they were, a lot of people ate mushrooms and then they thought that they saw reindeer flying. They weren't, but that is one psychedelic mushroom that's also been recorded in the Bible for uses um, as well. All right. This is my favorite thing in the world, okay? Mycoremediation. Can everybody say mycoremediation? Mycoremediation. Ah, oh, music to my ears. This is cutting edge, save the world, do it. Learn it, be it, live it. This is my dream, okay? Mycoremediation is this idea. Like I said, I could go over and touch Mitch and decompose him. This idea is the same thing. I can go into an oil spill if I'm a mushroom and I can break down that oil so that it's no longer contaminating places. I can go into a old brownstone or brownstone, what's the brown rock? Brownfield. Brownfield, right? Lead, contamination, whatever. I go in, I'm a mushroom. I break down all of those contaminants, right? Those carbons, because everything is just carbon chains when it comes down to it. And mushrooms can break that up. So mycoremediation has been proposed to clean up pharmaceutical waste. Um, it has been proposed to clean up agriculture waste, right? So excess runoff, poop. Um, it has also been proposed to clean up heavy metals. So lead in the water um, and plenty of other stuff. So what I'm gonna do right now, I'm gonna show you two case studies. The first one is about using soil with mushrooms to bring out fossil fuels. Now, in this study here, let me orient you real quick. All right, in this first orange bar, this is the soil untreated. And there is a concentration, a very high concentration of diesel in this. Now, after several treatments, you can see that, you know, it's basically almost all cleaned out of the soil. After, this is four weeks. This is four weeks. That's nothing for even like that much of an increase. Normally, if you are remediating an area, because before you build anything, the soil needs to be clean. In order to clean that area, what they do is they take trucks, they fill them up with all of the dirt, they take that truck and they incinerate it. Do you know how much money that costs? Like $300,000 for like a room this big, probably more. It's insane. So this is a great potential. Um, this is also being used in places like Ecuador, where Exxon Mobil was responsible for using millions and millions of barrels that was responsible for the death of God knows how much e like ecosystem. Um, and I have a friend and a colleague that I used to work with with mushrooms that is currently down there doing these exact down there. Okay, if you throw in some mycelium, you can greatly reduce the amount of contamination. And that's really important for places like Onondaga Lake, right? Onondaga Lake is a great case study because they have what is called combined sewer systems, which means every time it rains, that rain, if it's a lot of rain, is in the same sewer system as their poop. So as you can imagine, if there is a heavy rain, sewage will literally Really flood into the streets and then it flows into the water. Now, when you get that much fecal matter, that can change the biology of a lake. So I want us to start thinking about, you know, ways that we can incorporate micro remediation into our everyday issues rather than always turning to, um, you know, big industrial scale measures to clean up pollutants. You want to say anything about that? Uh, no. Uh, the only thing that we, uh, the, the cleanup of Onondaga Lake has been going on for a long, long time. 
And we often rely on very conventional methods of doing these things, which is filtration and removal and stuff like that, as opposed to embracing these newer ideas of let's break it down on site and try to incorporate natural processes. Uh, nature will take care of itself and harnessing the, the use of fungi and the enzymes they provide is just a matter of doing that. Um, and then the third one is wastewater. So has anybody visited a water treatment facility? Yeah, right. They're big. Surprising There's... amount of hands went yeah, up. Right? That's a lot of people you visiting guys are living good lives. <laughs> Why um, not? <laughs> yeah, but it's looking at technology like microremediation. And although I'm not going to sit here and tell you that mushrooms can clean up and make your water drinkable, um, it is just an alternative option that can save money in the long run and has just as good of results. So we have been testing this out in our classroom. Um, we've been growing different mycelium and then allowing water and other stuff to flow through it just, just for fun. Just trying it out, just see what fun. would happen. Um, but these are just things that we wanted to share with you to start thinking about. Um, one other thing that we've, Oh yeah, go ahead. Questions over here. We'll go right here and then we'll go over to you. Okay. Okay. On the previous slide, we had a word there of the just just below the green. Uh biospargic. I'm not good at the time to know what that is. Biospargic. <laughs> That's a great question. We're gonna have to look at that. Thank you for asking. All right, next. So she's asking when, like, what happens to the compound? Okay, so let's say I have a um, polycarbon chain, which is another word for oil and gas, right? It's a carbon chain, and there's different molecules off of it. What the mushroom is going to do is it's going, the enzymes are going to break down that chain. So it's not that it's like taking up and taking in all of those things, right? Because mushrooms are made, everything is made up of carbon. Um, so, and also mushrooms emit carbon, but they are going to basically break up that chain and put it into an organic form that is no longer toxic and then becomes bioavailable to other organisms in that ecosystem. Not always foolproof, but that's kind of the general gist of it. And one of the other things that might happen is getting it out of the water. And, and if you get like heavy metals and that kind of thing can accumulate in the mushroom and then it's easy to pick up as a solid waste yeah okay i'm sorry did i steal your thunder were you going to share that no, you my question, I okay yeah so so if there are things that can't break down mercury um lead stuff like that it will accumulate and collect in the mushroom and then you can take that and that's a lot easier to deal with yeah mm -hmm. okay yeah another question oh you looked up biospurging yeah okay i did too my guy <laughs> <laughs> i was going to pretend i knew go ahead <laughs> Sparging. Is an insight to remediation technology that uses indigenous microorganisms to biodegrade organic substances. And it goes further that it's a technique similar to bioventing, but there too. That air is connected to soil subsurface that stimulates microbial activity. So it sounds like so uh, we had somebody look up what bios. The air is probably oxygen enrichment. Right. Enhanced Right. So biosparging being the process of using the the fungus and the mushrooms there to break things down. All right. Thank you. All right. Any other? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead and look back. Uh, So he's asking what the relation is between the amount of mushrooms that you would need versus the amount of pollution that there is. So what that looks like is different treatment applications. Like I shown in that graph of the, that slide with the bar graph, um, 
Now you're saying mushrooms and you're not going to be able to like quantify that number. What's going to happen is the mycelium is going to expand in the soil and it's going to grow and break down that stuff. And then you can do different um, application treatments like over and over again over the long term. But generally speaking, I would say if you were, we're kind of trying to research that now, there is better research out there. Um, but if you, let's say, plop mycelium every foot spaced away over, you know, a room this big, you can pretty much expect that the mycelium is going to infiltrate every square inch. Now, one thing that there's promising um, research in, you know, we, we know we have a plastic problem, okay, is that fungus will also break down plastic, which is something we didn't think of as biodegradable. You know, we talk about microplastics, we talk about how plastic is here forever. Um, something as simple as an oyster mushroom, which some of you may walk away from today if you play your cards right, um, it can break down some elements of plastic as well as turkey tail, which are both uh, turkey tail you can find around here. Um, Again, these organisms are made to break things down and especially things in, that are you know, carbon-based, which is what oil is and plastic inevitably, okay? All right, so you guys have gotten kind of an idea of where current research is. Before I look at the next slides, do we think that there's a market for mushrooms? Yes, right, right, right. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, now my next question is, do you think that besides what I just showed you, how many millions of ideas or how many millions of ways do you think that we could apply mushrooms, right, and their recycling power? So I know as a biology teacher, I talk about, you know, we've all heard herbivore, carnivore, omnivore. I talk about that all day long. But the decomposers, that's what gets left out so much. And this is kind of my way of saying, like, what more can we do with this concept of decomposition, with this concept of killing that joke? Kidding, kidding. Um, so this is why comes I, up so often. <laughs> <laughs> I I see mushrooms as a money maker, right? I would like to acquire wealth. I am 26 years old, and I, you know, I'm second year teacher. My income, I'm not going to be able to get rich off of teaching. I'm not trying to get rich off of mushrooms, but I'm just saying, this is a really good graph that shows the, when I was talking about micro remediation, um, it's $50 to take care of a ton. Now, normally to take care of a ton using incineration, it is around, you know, like over $1,600. So if you look at that cost comparison alone, right, it, there are a lot of potential growth that could happen um and i would like to make a business about that anybody wants to invest me 10 years down the road find me. um <laughs> please um now this is a general uh trend that breaks down the market the dark purple is food and beverage as you can see there is a steady increase in the amount that is projected um this graph starts at 2019 and goes through 2028 um as you can see the market's already grown over the last couple of years um, then there's also the dietary supplements, pharmaceutical, and then others. Um, so I would, I would expect the pharmaceutical one to all of a sudden start picking up steam. Um, and I would, you know, as we've seen with, uh, you know, marijuana and other loosening of, uh, of government regulations, all of a sudden you're going to, we're thinking that, uh, cannabis, sorry, we're going to start thinking of um, the mushroom market uh, really exploding soon. Uh, now that we're seeing some positive results from, from the recent studies. And New York state is also looking at D well, we've already decriminalized psilocybin use. Um, and we're looking at legalizing it for medicinal uses, probably not an expert, but I'd say like five years from now. Um, yeah. Yeah. What's the US point? That's just the projected U S like GDP growth. Um, not GDP. I read the wrong thing. Just projected growth. I don't. I'm going to look that up. There we go. Okay. Um, now, oh, 
Yeah, you have that. All right, so here's the deal. Um, one thing that's been really promising, and I have a video that goes along with this. Um, I don't know, I hope I, no one's already seen it before, but uh, fungus are, they're out there competing, okay? They're waging a war, and one of the things they wage war against is insects. Um, we spend a lot of money on pesticides. Uh, we spend a lot of money, and we do a lot of damage with pesticides. Um, one thing that there's been, uh, we're going to go back to our friend Paul Stamets, who's from uh, out in Oregon, doing some really interesting research. And if you watch Fantastic Fungus on Netflix, you're going to get to know him. Um, there, he's done some really interesting research on how to use uh, fungus to repel insects, especially ants um, and other pests like that. Let me see if I can find the website. Here. It's compound annual growth rate. All right. All right. Now I've got a video here that shows what fungus can do to an ant, and hopefully it not your will, uncle though. Just, no, it's just oh, that's bad. All right. All right. Uh, we're just waiting for the computer to catch up with what I want it to do. Uh, let's see. We'll go like this. I hope. Hold on. We're just waiting for the computer. All right, there we go. I can provide some singing. Nope, we're good. It's working. <laughs> Wait a minute. Okay, here we go. Uh, is it my turn? Nope, it's working. I promise. We don't need to sing. Rainforests are mostly dependent on no one species, mainly on the other hand. <laughs> Something that is taking control of its movements, like a puppeteer pulling up a string to a marionette. The fifth one, the final act, for which the ant has no choice. It must find a place to bite down, tenderly to the restation. Sweet dreams tonight, everybody. <laughs> oh, yeah. How about that? Spores will be passed into the air currents where they will claim more ant victims. But it's not just ants. Many others are impacted by the cortisex fungus. All right, now that I've successfully creeped everybody out, um, just wanted to show the, the possibility of what fungus can do as a pesticide. Um, when chemicals, you know, they stay in our environment so long, this fungus does its job and then it's done, okay? It doesn't hang around and get in our drinking water. And it doesn't, by the way, I just want to make sure that everybody at home knows it doesn't do that to you, okay? It's not, you're not going to become a zombie fungus, okay? All right. 
All right, so just to take a second to recognize some, I love local education, right? Um, these are some local establishments around Rochester. Um, Smugtown Mushrooms, um, that is a local place that um, Olga runs it, and her name's Olga. She distributes mushroom packs just like we have here. She also sells um just straight up mushrooms mushroom supplements all of that stuff um i think you can access that via online um and then we have here i had a leap foods logo um but leap foods which on your way out uh or if you have already there is a bag courtesy of leap foods it is not edible do not eat the bag or what's in the bag obviously you're not gonna eat the bag um uh, i wouldn't judge you if you did but the Leap Foods is a local Rochester mushroom company that started out of RIT doing um, different research. They produce mushrooms that are sold in Wegmans, um, a bunch of health stores around here, and they make blue oyster, shiitake, and lion's mane. Um, we have been working with Leap Foods um, kind of just as a fun way because I, I worked there, I volunteered there a few years back, and then get this, right? His neighbor also works at Leaf Foods. And he was like, hey, my neighbor works for this mushroom place. Like, let's connect. And then it turns out it was Leaf Foods and I had already like kind of known him. And it was, that's, that's life, right? Um, so we have been getting their waste, which is our goal, right? So we've been getting their mycelium byproduct. Um, and we're basically at this point looking at ways that we can utilize that byproduct that they have and get a revenue source out of it instead of them, you know, just throwing it away or sending it to the farmer, which they normally do. Um, last on this, there is, has anybody seen the mushroom house in Pittsburgh? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. yeah. had to give it some clout, right? Um, yes. Oh, and then lastly, um, one last thing that we, we we're looking at in the future, you know, we don't, no one likes styrofoam. Um, what we're seeing is some promising use of mycelium as a packing product where you could put it into a mold, let it grow, and then it forms around whatever you want to ship. Um, and then it's 100% compostable. Um, and you can, uh, there's a company, um, mushroom packaging dot, and they will you send them your product. They grow mushrooms around it. And then it's, it's, it feels like cardboard. It's dry. And it, when you're done with it, you can just toss it out in the yard and it's gone. Okay. So no more styrofoam. Um, Okay. All right. Give the code. Yeah. All right. And we have a post quiz for you. Uh, we just need to get that. So if you want to get quizzes out again, I mean, maybe that first quiz was traumatic for some people who weren't expecting to be tested for the first time since they were in high school. Jackie's Jack's going to put the code in. Three, three, one, four. This one's a little easier. I promise. You should be it's able to do well. Still, we are going to assess your progress, <laughs> and we will announce the winner. Um, now, here's the deal: if you are, uh, we're we're open to questions, but also here's oh, and they had a question in the back. I forgot to call on you. Okay. It's quizzes. Joinmyquizzes.com, and then the code is three three one four four one seven nine. Oh, I'm going to tell you. Yeah, let me. I, we had a question. I forgot to call on you, sir. Oh. Leap, L E E P foods, and they're in Henrietta. And if you go into Wegmans, I know they have them at my way, my Wegmans is East Ave Wegmans. Um, and you go to their mushroom section, the shiitake, the lion's mane, and the blue oyster, they're all organic and they sell directly to Wegmans, and it's a specific facility right out in Henrietta and it, they they do a great business out there and they don't throw away the mycelium bags that we have here would have been composted um, but they let us take them and experiment with them so they're the ones they're the post mushroom growing stuff but they're still viable mycelium um, which is what we're going to tell you about what's in your bag I saw another question right here and then we'll go in the back This is 
Absolutely. Thank you for asking that question. So she was asking, if you're out in the woods, how do you know what is safe, what is not safe? Um, so I want to say, you can always, 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 always touch. Always. Even if, you, so here's a funny story. There is a, a mushroom called the angel of death or the death cap. It's common around here. It's pure white. I was at a mushroom camp living in the woods for like a month because I'm weird like that's that. What that's what people do. No, I <laughs> was holding on to the death cap mushroom for like an hour. I was like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen, right? I was holding on to it. My hands are covered in spores probably. Then I ate an apple. I thought I was going to die for like 30 minutes. I had like a full blown panic. I'm running around this camp. I'm trying to like ask people, I'm like, oh, what's going to happen? Nothing. Nothing. Even if the spores, if you breathe them in or touch them on every mushroom growing outside, that's fine. Um, the only issue that you get into is if you are, for example, dealing with a house mold or something like that, you don't really want to touch that because you can stir up those spores and breathe them in. And that can cause a lot of, you know, toxic, toxicity to enter your body. Um, your, the second part of your question having to do with like, how do you know? Um, I always recommend to stay on the safe side. Never, ever, 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 ever eat a mushroom unless you are 100% confident. Now, the ways you can know to be 100% confident is by, you know, doing your research. I have been into mushrooms for, I don't know, like six years, not that long. I'm, I'm young, but I still don't ever really eat what I forage unless it's like chicken of the woods and I can identify it right away. It's bright orange. I can check online. I know every single trait of the mushroom. I have, I'm going to use the word literacy again. I have mycological literacy. I can read into the mushroom and understand it. And until you get there, I don't recommend, you know, eating or foraging, but you can always, uh, you know, like use a guidebook. And real quickly, I just want to say that one thing I learned from Jack is that it, you don't hurt the mushroom by picking it. Yeah. That is, that, it's actually something that she told me is beneficial because you're going to spread that spore around. So it's, you know, you're not going to, all the stuff is underneath the soil. So picking a mushroom is not damaging it. So I just want to make yeah. sure you know. But that. one other side thing, it is always good to use indigenous. Um, I like to kind of use indigenous knowledge to inform my foraging. So you should never, ever, ever, if you don't see more than one of something, you should not take from that ecosystem because that is adding to the ecological diversity and diversity is key in all spaces. So even if you are foraging and you see like heaven's trolley of chanterelles, right? You don't want to take, please don't take all the chanterelles. That's just like not good karma, not good for anyone. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, we just have someone online suggesting that there is a mushroom identification group on Facebook. Yes. Those are great. I'm on like four Facebook groups for mushroom ideas. In college, I had, yeah. In college, I had to identify 30 different species. I cheated the entire way through. I used Google. I didn't cheat, but like I used my resources, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. So I recommend a bunch of areas yeah the rochester area my uh mycological association he's recommending um they you can get connected with them if you google them um i'm not connected at the moment to go it's on my list um but he's saying at forays which is a giant mushroom kind of forage place uh, at the end that's a really great place to learn and get um familiar with mushrooms and how their structures work and how to identify different components i think we had one more question i forgot there's someone in the back away in the back did you have one sorry i forgot to come back to you yeah that, that that's a tough one to wreck us up but um uh yeah 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 we're, we're getting there uh, question up front. Uh, some mushrooms, like a morel, are so so uniquely identifiable. If you get into trouble, if you try a batch of morels, well, you have morels, and then you have false morels. Literally, like that is so. In a lot of same thing with chanterelles. 
right? It's like a dead giveaway, but there's still some species. So if you know what you're looking at, if you have a guidebook or if you have access to Facebook groups, you know, we have technology now. So you can always utilize that with something like, you can't pass up a morale, right? Mm. That, what morales do you have to do that? Sorry. Mm. Um, but yeah, there's some lookalikes as well. Uh, one more question in the back, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, so he was asking what other than uh, for psilocybin, what are some of the long-term impacts of that on your brain? Um, so due to the research that was during the Nixon era, um, a lot of that has been kind of lost because they had the answers to that um, for those longevity studies. Um, and now we're at a point, Johns Hopkins University is doing research on that. Um, and I don't, there's answers to that at this moment. I don't believe, also not an expert. That's a great question. Be a guinea pig. <laughs> yeah. Long-term stuff, we're, we're still figuring out, but you know, the, these natural things are usually a lot better than the stuff that comes from a lab. Um, yes. Nature doesn't try to do bad things to us, you know, in general. So we can pretty much assume that our body can process that natural substances better. And just to relate to that, um, there are new theories emerging as to the influence that psilocybin or other psychedelic mushrooms had on human evolution and its impact on the development of our brain, specifically the prefrontal cortex, which separates us from other mammals. Um, so given that, I would say I don't, I fully endorse psychedelics. But we are not doctors. We are not, we are not doctors. doctors. We're just hobbyists. I, okay. you know. We got a question here, and then we'll go to the back. Go right up front. Um, observing the law of unintended consequences, if mushrooms, mycelia, mycelia breaks, become uh, made sink for various purposes, we're laying out here in encyclopedia. Uh, Jack can answer more than that, but the, the, just like the, my last slide, um, this packaging company says it takes about seven days to grow a mycelium package. So if you could make that on industrial scale and grow bricks at that same rate, we're talking bricks and a brick in seven days if you had that system set up. Yeah, and with regards to the deforestation, was that what you were kind of asking? No, you start relating it to well, just, uh, foresting. Yeah, just a an analogy. Yeah. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. So you can get them processed pretty quickly. Um, and then you can do all of that internally and mushrooms will eat various plant and biomass types of materials. So it doesn't have to be like straight up trees. Um, the mix that wheat foods uses, for example, is part soybean, part corn, part, uh, there's like five different things in there. It's yeah. not all just trees. So it, it can happen very quickly, you know, Go ahead. What happens when these bricks get wet? So in a housing situation, the brick is basically like treated in a way that it's not going to grow anymore. If it gets wet, we're going to Google. We're going to yeah, Google. That's a good question. Yeah. So it, there, there's ways to treat it so it doesn't become activated again. Um, even though from our initial quiz, you can see that mycelium can stay dormant for decades um, and then come alive again. But one of the other ideas is to use it as insulation, okay, inside the house, that kind of thing. So um, yeah, I would yeah. actually let's let's theorize because we can think that problem through, right? What happens if your house gets wet on the inside? You have a leak, mold, right? What happens if a brick gets wet? It's probably going to end up absorbing versus an entire wall that now has water damage and everything on it. So I would say it's probably more resilient to things like that, but- um, Most people probably don't want mushrooms growing into their house yeah. and activating like that. So I don't think- Speak for yourself. Well, okay, yeah, I'm sorry. You're, you're a different breed. 
Yeah. Uh, so she's asking, she had a mushroom growing in the corner of her carpet. Um, is there an explanation? It was a fun guy, leave him alone, okay? I don't know, that just happens sometimes. It really just comes down to what, yeah, of course it was, but what is available for them to break down? Yes. By the way, this is my mom, everybody. She came to watch the show, and that's my I dad. Really that's my mom. <laughs> Tell her how great I was on the way out, all right? Okay, so what you have in your bag is some uh, basically spent mushroom mycelium um, from Leaf Foods. So Leaf Foods grew their mushrooms for Wegmans. It got tired. They were going to compost it. They said, we can have it. Now, this is, um, this. is we've had great success of putting it in the right conditions and having it come back to life and getting mushrooms. So what we're asking you to do is if you would like to, we have two varieties of mushrooms that mushroom mycelium that you can take home with you. Um, they're both edible. Um, we have oyster mushroom and lion's mane. Um, what we are recommending um, is that you, so this is what we did in our classroom. We put it under soil in an aquarium. If you look on the left side, put under soil in an aquarium, put some water, amount of water with it. And we planted some grass on it, just see what would happen. And we got mushrooms coming up. That's blue oyster mushrooms growing in the back of my classroom that Jack comes and helps me out with. Um, and here's the deal. Um, we would like to see what you would do with it. And if you could figure out what could happen. Um, we have, from our experience, with the appropriate amount of water, um, it, they seem to like soil on top, but they also like some airflow. We tried to do it in jars. We didn't get the same results. Um, but see what happens if you take some home. Um, and, you know, really what they need is the right moisture and temperature. Um, and do some citizen science read. Okay. And then if you come up with something good, send us a picture. We'd like to know what you did. Uh, question over there. Yeah. Yeah. This. So th this is just a little chunk, but if you put it, what what we've seen is it, it grows with. Um, it likes some organic material to grow with, so we've using um, hardwood pellets to put with it. That sometimes helps it out because that's what they like to grow with. Um, but play around with it, see what comes up. Um, you know, the one thing you want to make sure of, and Jack can talk more about this, is if it does get moldy, um, that's a problem. And if you see like, you know what mold looks like, it's it's usually bluish, greenish kind of stuff on it. But if it's got the 
like sort of fingers coming out of it, that's good mycelial growth. Mm -hmm. Okay, you'll see it actually come alive. It's pretty interesting. Yes. We have a place in the Adirondacks, and uh, there are all kinds of mushrooms around, but not these. That not those. Mm -hmm. What's the best way? And we're going up for Thanksgiving. What's the best way to put back these mushrooms? Out there in the woods that have to grow? That's a great question. So, a common method is so there is one term, they call it a uh, no. Basically, if you take cardboard and you get the cardboard wet and you take that mycelium and you put it in that wet cardboard and then you roll it up um, and then you take that rolled up cardboard, you stick that in a plastic bag, let it sit with some moisture. You got to get it moist. Um, let it sit. You'll see that the mushroom is going to activate and start eating that cardboard. Then you can take that and stick it in the soil. The, um, the oyster mushrooms like woody material. So you want to stick that near like woods or trees, dead trees. And then the lion's mane. Um, yeah, same. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Why the plastic? You take it, out of, take it oh. out of the plastic bag before you put it in the moisture though so basically when they're growing those mushroom bags that mushroom isn't going to pop out until oxygen is introduced so when it is we call it myceliating or like eating up everything getting ready to grow into its sexual structure um it won't start growing into that fruiting body until oxygen has reached it so that's why you pull it out of the bag and then put it in the soil yeah. I have a couple of questions. Uh, the mushrooms that grow around here, do they grow all over the world? I mean, are these mushrooms we're talking about they grow the entire plant? That's a good question. So he's asking, are the mushrooms here the same mushrooms that grow all over the world? No. Are the, the plants that we have here the same ones that are in the Amazon or in you know the Sahara? So mushroom diversity is beautiful. You can find some crossovers um, depending. It's basically latitudinally. Like if you're at the same latitude, chances are likely that the same types of mushrooms will grow at that temperature because they have the same climate and the same needs. You mentioned about, because that's one of the things I come here for because of the, uh, you know, mental health is one of the things mm -hmm. that like what I hear now, they doing some type of thing for depression or something. Yeah. You know, like that. And, uh, uh, this LSD, I know I heard this mentioned way back in the 60s when I was young. And I heard our lead patterns of it jumped out the window and so it was all, you know, like that, that's why they might want to get that. But I was wondering, you mentioned about the human, the human being as far as the mind. I know that, you know, the human being thinks, you know, other animals, you know, they think it's dream. But could this have something to do with dreams? So he's asking, can psychedelics have the, uh, are, are those, uh, you know, related to our ability to dream? Uh, correlation and causation, you don't know, we don't know. We don't have that science to back it up. Um, but there has been research about humans when we turn into bilateral, meaning walking on two legs, our ability to hunt and forage also changed at that point. And you know what's better that what's better go and forage a mushroom or you know spend 2000 calories trying to chase down an animal to kill so they think that that was a large contribution into our diet and that's what allowed that initial thing but there's not really the science right now to it's conjecture yeah. Yeah. but it, it, there's strong evidence but it's conjecture still yeah no no no, you don't want to see mold. No, you if, throw it out yeah, if you see mold, you it's best. Still play with it. It's not going to help bother you or anything. Yeah. I would eat it. Don't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can eat the fruiting body even if the mycelium is moldy. Oh. Okay. So, um, so. You have to Oh, the library's closing. Yeah. You guys asked too many good questions. <laughs> um, the excellent job. If anybody wants to come over and see some more stuff, we've also got examples of shiitake mushroom brick. We've also got lion's mane brick and a, a oyster mushroom brick. Um, and there's more free samples. We'd rather not take them home. So if you see that, you know, hang around a little bit and see if everybody that wanted one gets one and then take another if you, there's extra. 
All right. All right. And Cheryl's going to wrap up. Um, thank you, Color Bright and Green, for sponsoring this. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And you all gave for the plunge and the quiz at the end. You all did phenomenal. Perfect score. Excellent job.